Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, Steve Hall, and I am here today with Gabrielle Fundero. Hopefully I pronounced the last name correctly. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, not like me, I'm normally awful with names. So Gabrielle, probably a lot of you won't have heard of her, um, although hopefully in the coming number of weeks, months, you will do. And she is associated and actually works with Renaissance Periodization. So you guys know Jared Feather, you know Mike Israel, obviously, who have both been on the podcast. Uh, Gabrielle is a coach for Renaissance Periodization for good reason. So she has a BS in exercise, sport and health education, a PhD in human nutrition, foods and exercise. Um, and she specifically, and what we're going to be talking about is the gut. And she studied the role of probi probiotics, yes, not pre, on gut health and skeletal muscle metabolism. So she recently, I think it was last year, became a coach for Renaissance Periodization, um, coaching men, women from all across different sports and areas, and has also dabbled in many of these herself. And we were just talking off air, and she actually has only done one uh, bodybuilding competition, uh, women's physique, and she actually won that, which is really awesome. So a lot of our audience are physique competitors or coaches and that like, um, but also has now been dabbling in powerlifting and done pretty well there too. So that's really exciting. And again, our audience base tend to be powerlifters and physique athletes. So they can definitely relate to you, Gabrielle. And uh, just so you know, in her free time, she also enjoys hiking, camping, lifting weights, visiting museums, volunteering, spending time with her dogs and cats. And I think it just makes a person more relatable when you know these sort of individual things. So how are you, Gabrielle? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? I, I am well. Um, I'm really actually excited to delve into the topic that we're going to be delving into today. And uh, because it's just an area that's kind of under-researched and I think there's people who are, I think it's generally like personal trainers and coaches sometimes move out of their scope of practice and it becomes a bit dangerous because people start talking about hormones. Now people are talking about gut health. And sometimes, I mean, people talk about injury prevention and physiotherapy and it's not the area of expertise and that can lead people down rabbit holes and dangerous things can happen. And we see it even with the kind of general public where people are like avoiding gluten or whatever they're doing. They just see something that's like, this is good for your gut. And they're just like, let's run and use this uh, without any prior knowledge. So the reason we got Gabrielle on is because I know RP are doing their new um, diet ebook and Gabrielle has written a portion for gut health uh, and we want to delve into the specifics of that. So if you want to kind of talk about maybe what the, that chapter includes um, and then I'm sure we can delve into some specifics. I have things like supplementation, kind of fasting protocols, food composition, macronutrient composition, composition even, and those sort of effects as well. So um, I'll let you ramble on. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's just some of the background on um, kind of how I found myself in this area because originally um, the lab that I did my doctorate in, we actually were focused on skeletal muscle physiology uh, and biochemistry and metabolism. Um, and what we were really studying at the time when I was doing my PhD was the role of high fat diet in what we turn... Um, and what many people utilize this term is metabolic flexibility. So that's the ability of a tissue to switch between substrate or fuel source. So ideally, if you have a lot of glucose available, you want your skeletal muscle to be using glucose. If you have a lot of fatty acids available, you want your skeletal muscle to be using fatty acids. Um, and we were using a mouse model for a lot of it. And mice are a little bit more flexible anyway than humans are. But when you put a mouse or a human on a high fat diet, you actually, they lose that metabolic flexibility. So not only does the skeletal muscle become insulin resistant, it also loses its ability to utilize fatty acids. And so you get more intramuscular triglyceride stores, which can be inflammatory. And then you also get that insulin resistance, which can eventually develop into type two diabetes. So um, one of the ways that we would uh, challenge the, the metabolic pathways of these mice is that we would inject them with something called LPS or lipopolysaccharide. Um, and that wasn't something that we um, necessarily were looking into mechanistically in terms of where was the lipopolysaccharide coming from. It was just, this is what we injected the mice with. And then we would find that they would experience this low grade inflammation. And then when we would run um, 
assays on skeletal muscle that we had extracted, it would be less metabolically flexible. And I was really curious as to why we were actually using this LPS. Where did it come from? Why did it cause this low-grade inflammation? And um, my advisor at the time, you know, he explained that this was a, a component of bacterial cell walls, and those bacteria could be found in the gut. And somehow the LPS was finding its way sometimes out of the gut and into the bloodstream, and then it could bind to these um, immune receptors and cause low-grade inflammation. And then I said, well, how is it getting out of the gut? I mean, shouldn't we be kind of looking at what's going on in the gut? If this is causing this serious issue that we've linked to obesity and a high fat diet, type 2 diabetes, I mean, don't we want to get at the, the core, like the actual problem? And um, initially, I mean, because that wasn't our, our area of expertise, there weren't really any opportunities for me to kind of look at that side of things. But then um, an opportunity came in the form of a grant from a, a company that produces a probiotic called BSL-3. So uh, probiotics are beneficial bacteria that you can ingest that enrich the gut. And BSL-3 specifically is a really potent uh, medical food grade multi-strain probiotic that has been shown to be effective for um, a wide variety of inflammatory bowel diseases. And we wanted to use it as an intervention um, during high fat feeding. And so um, my, the, the, the majority of my doctoral research was um, going in every day gavage mice, which basically is a tube feeding procedure. So you take this tiny little um, ballpoint needle and, you know, gently insert it down. <laughs> the sport mouse and uh, inject, you know, probiotics or placebo every day. We had these mice on either a control or a high fat diet. And in most cases, when you see high fat diet, it's also high in saturated fat and high in refined carbohydrates. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. But um, we did the same thing in humans and um, really found that, you know, the, the probiotic supplementation wasn't protective against gaining body fat. Um, there was modest protection against insulin resistance. Um, but part of the problem was just that our mice didn't get as obese as we wanted them to get. And so they didn't experience the deleterious effects. So it may not be just high fat diet, but also high fat diet plus obesity. Um, and then you get this sort of culminating effect that leads to um, or it could be just these things are, are correlates, you know, high fat diet, obesity, and low grade inflammation. Um, so that was sort of the background on how I got into things was that I was just really curious about where this LPS actually came from and why we were using it. You know, is it physiologically relevant? And it absolutely is mm -hmm. because this lipopolysaccharide comes from the bacteria that uh, reside within a human gut as well. So um, the, the gut health um, portion of the ebook does give a little bit of an explanation on how exactly you become colonized. Um, it talks about enterotypes. Enterotypes are a little bit controversial. Um, it's sort of like how, you know, for a while we thought that there were specific body types like ectomorph, yeah. mesomorph, and endomorph. So enterotypes are similarly controversial because while you may be able to organize something, so we have, um, you know, taxa, basically levels of organization of, of how we classify living things. Um, so if you classify them by what we would say uh, is the, the phyla level, if you think about this like a tree, a phyla is sort of, the phyla level is sort of like big, big branches and then you have a genus level, which is a little bit more specific. And then you have a species level, and those are sort of like twigs. So if you look at the phyla, that it's so diverse within a single phyla that you can't necessarily say that a phyla will predict the activities of that person's gut in a specific way. Um, so that's why enterotypes are a little bit controversial. But I still think they're helpful in terms of talking about, you know, the big groups of bacteria that you have in your gut. And then you can break that down a little bit more specifically, not even just by um, the, the types of bacteria in terms of species, but also their metabolic activities. 
So do you have bacteria that are more specialized to metabolizing carbohydrates or proteins? And we see that the types of bacteria that you have and then also the overall diversity um, plays a significant role in, I mean, not just gut health, but skeletal muscle health, um, even mental health. So we see that there are far-reaching effects. So I talk a little bit about um, colonization and then um, the types of bacteria that you might see in some of the correlates. I do touch on the uh, effects of the gut microbiome in appetite and metabolic regulation. Um, and then the biggest focus really is the effect of diet on the microbiome. So if your diet is higher in um, fats and carbohydrates and proteins, um, some of the correlates that we see with how that affects the profile of your gut microbiome and then how that in turn influences your health. Um, then I talk about um, the role of pro and prebiotics and how we've seen them to be effective for um, improving inflammatory bowel diseases and um, their effects on uh, metabolism and kind of differentiating between pro and prebiotics. So probiotics are actual bacteria that you can ingest versus prebiotics are fibers that specifically have to be um, fermentable by those bacteria. So not all fibers are treated in the same way. And some of them, I mean, all fiber is beneficial in your diet, but some of it is just going to be used to produce bulk in your stool, whereas others can actually, other types of fiber can be fermented. And that has really huge benefits, um, not just on the gut microbiome, but on the cells of your gut um, and even sort of just um, overall metabolic health, appetite regulation. Um, and then the last little section, and I'll go into each of these a little bit, in a little bit more depth, but just giving you an overview. Um, the last section talks about the a relationship between exercise and the gut microbiome. So this is a really new, this is an emerging area of research. Um, there's actually, I, I'm looking more now because I'm going to be doing actually a second book that's going to be entirely gut health. Amazing. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. But um, as I was writing this and I was, and I was looking at for articles on exercise in the microbiome, I found that 99% of the articles use uh, an endurance exercise model. So there are only two studies that I've found um, in a lot of searching. Um, there are about uh, probably 150 or so articles on exercise in the microbiome. And I found two that used resistance <laughs> training. Um, and one was actually a combo of resistance and aerobic training. So that's an area that really has not been explored. Like we really don't know the influence of the microbiome on resistance training and vice versa. Um, we do see that there are some correlations between um, endurance exercise, voluntary endurance exercise, and the diversity of the gut microbiome. And we see that there are some specific um, uh, bacteria that are more prevalent in the guts of people who are physically active versus those who are sedentary. Um, and then that's part of the reason why this idea of enterotypes is sort of changing because originally we had um, kind of three main enterotypes that was the um, Firmicutes, uh, Bacteroidetes, and Actinobacteria. And now we're sort of seeing this shift towards, you know, instead of saying that it's bacteria, Steroidetes, they're taking it to a more specific level and looking at um, the genus Prevotella. Um, so as we're, you know, performing more of these studies and finding different ways to analyze the types of bacteria that are there, um, just, you know, we're getting more, probably more questions than we have answers. Um, and so some of the ideas about which types of bacteria are pathogenic versus beneficial, that's starting to change. So you can look at bacteria in terms of just like looking at what types of bacteria are there um, by, you know, the genes that they're expressing, or you can look at what types of metabolic pathways are there in the types of genes that they're expressing. And so that also kind of adds to the confusion um, in, the air, in, in this body of research because 
depending on the lab, they may use different methods of determining what bacteria are present. Um, so that's kind of the overview. Do you want me to go into like a little bit more specifics on each section yeah i think it, it would be fantastic to i mean it sounds fascinating i think it's it's very much like sleep is becoming more and more known to be something that is really important and people kind of just shrug off they're just like training nutrition that's all that matters and then oh yeah to like sleep's becoming so important and now gut health is coming and um you can see it and like with what you're saying it's becoming very very clear so no for sure i think delving into some of those topics and um kind of i think an answer i'd really like to help the listeners with is kind of like how do people identify whether what they're experiencing is normal good bad or kind of i think a lot of people just eat and they go to the toilet and they're not really even thinking about things they're just like they just get used to it um and there might yeah. be something actually quite wrong or they might just be absolutely fine so no that'd be great okay yeah absolutely um well i think one of the biggest takeaways is that you cannot really recolonize your gut so so colonization pretty much as you are either exiting the vaginal canal or in the case of the C-section, when you're entering the operating room. Um, and uh, in, in really some, some great epidemiologic studies, they've shown that uh, an infant who is born via vaginal birth and then breastfed, their microbiome will be much more will be more similar to the microbiome of the mother versus a child who is birthed via C-section and then bottle fed, not only will they sort of lack um, microbial diversity, it will more closely resemble that of the, just the external environment, say like in the clinical setting, not to say that there's wrong with C-section or bottle feeding. I mean, you know, these things are a uh, personal choice or maybe out of necessity, it's just something um, to keep in mind that you are colonized really before you have any say in the matter and kind of what you get is what you get. Uh, and then our, our microbiome is rapidly developing up until the age of about two or three. Um, and at that point, we sort of have our adult microbiome. And so certainly, you know, early childhood diet, um, any ch chronic use of antibiotics, um, whether you have pets in the house, whether you spend a lot of time outside, all of those things can influence the diversity of your microbiome. Um, so then once you get to about, you know, toddler age, like I said, what you get is what you get. And you pretty much stick with that until you reach about 60 or so years of age. And then you begin to lose microbial diversity once again. And that could be due to, um, you know, if you're in an assisted living home and, you know, maybe in a more sterile environment, it could be due to changes in diet. Um, so the influence of diet and exercise together probably can explain about 40% of your microbial diversity. And then the other 60%, mm, we're not really sure. And, you know, we can't say that there's a causative role, but these are all just correlations that we've seen. Um, so the three kind of big groups of bacteria, the most prevalent um, phyla that we see are the Formicutes, the Bacteroidetes, and then Actinobacteria. Now, back in the day, um, when I was in grad school, which I was not that long ago, but um, we said that the Formicutes were obesogenic. So if you had a high ratio of Formicutes, you were going to be obese. If you had a high ratio of Bacteroidetes, you were not going to be obese. And so that was what people looked at. But the problem is that there are types of um, Formicutes bacteria that are pathogenic, some that, are, that people might be familiar with, like H. pylori um, or C. difficile, um, uh, staph, listeria, that's a really common foodborne um, illness causing bacteria. But then we actually have some beneficial formicutes. So most people would not say that lactobacillus, which is what we see in most probiotics, is a harmful bacteria. Um, and then within the bacteroidetes, we have the bacteroides group, and those can actually be harmful because they um, metabolize proteins. They can actually break down the mucus layer in your intestines, and that's bad. That mucus is really protective. And then we have Prevotella. 
And Prevotella is associated with um, a more active lifestyle and with carbohydrate metabolism. So those guys are, are probably not harmful. Um, and then these actinobacteria, they didn't really get a lot of press, but um, within that group, we have the bifidobacteria. And those guys are also commonly found in probiotics and um, have been linked to beneficial health effects. So in most cases, you know, we kind of, I think we need to move away from, uh, from APDs being obesogenic and bacteroidetes being completely harmless. And you have to look really more at what are those bacteria doing? And in most cases, we see that, you know, bacteria like um, bifidobacteria, especially if they're able to ferment um, fibers to short chain fatty acids, that's beneficial because those short chain fatty acids like butyrate especially can be used as fuel by the intestinal cells, um, which helps increase the kind of integrity of our gut as a first line of defense defense our immune system. Um, and they also have been shown to increase levels of things like um, peptide YY and ghrelin, things that help to regulate our appetite. Um, and so we found that because bacteria are, are highly specialized, pretty much what you put into the gut can dictate what types of bacteria will be more prevalent. Because the, the gut is home to... Um, tens of trillions of bacteria. I mean, it's a few pounds worth of biomass of bacteria. They're all competing for real estate. Um, you also have different pH levels. So it's more acidic in the proximal small intestine that's close to your stomach. Um, and then as we move into the large intestine, the colon, um, it's less acidic. And so you see that some bacteria are really happy in an acidic environment like lactobacillus super cool in the proximal um, section of the small intestine. And then as we get into the large intestine, the colon, um, you get a much greater diversity of bacteria there. And so we want to um, support the growth of these beneficial bacteria because they can control the levels of the pathogenic bacteria and then also help produce those beneficial short chain fatty acids. Um, so, in general, we find that, um, and I don't, when I say plant-based, I don't mean plant-exclusive, and I'm not knocking fat, but in general, in general, um, in studies that we've seen in both mice and in humans, eating a high-fiber, high-carbohydrate, lower-fat diet generally correlates with more microbial diversity, uh, greater numbers of beneficial bacteria, and reduced incidence of um, gut permeability. So gut permeability has been sort of, I want to say that the, the term has been abused a little bit. People leaky say like gut. leaky gut. Yes. So everyone now has a leaky gut or everyone has gluten sensitivity or, or you know, this is number of food sensitivities. Um, and it's not to say that we don't see increased gut permeability. We absolutely do. Um, now we've seen this more, you know, you can study it a little bit more directly in mice because you can do the high fat diet intervention and then you sacrifice those mice and you can remove their intestines and then you can, um, you know, measure uh, levels of what we call tight junction proteins. N not so easy to do that in a human. You know, you can, you can take biopsies and whatnot. But um, so a lot of this stuff that we've looked at in terms of gut permeability, you know, directly we've done in mice, but in a human, you can feed them a high fat diet or even a high fat meal and then measure levels of circulating lipopolysaccharide or LPS. So um, as I had mentioned before, LPS is a constituent, uh, uh, it's a component of um, the cell wall of certain types of bacteria. And usually those are going to be the ones that we consider to be pathogenic. Um, but there are, uh, like I said, you know, we can't say that all the Firmicutes, uh give off LPS. That's not the case. So there are bacteria in many, there are, there are many different types of bacteria among the different phyla that can release this LPS or lipopolysaccharide. But you can actually measure circulating levels of LPS um, in the blood of a human. And from there, you can extrapolate that, okay, because we saw increased levels of 
circulating LPS, we know that that comes from the gut. And so we know that there was increased gut permeability. We know that more of the LPS was exiting the gut. In a mouse, you can actually test those tight junction proteins. So you can think of the intestinal cells, the enterocytes, they kind of stick together like this. And between each cell, they have these tight junction proteins that sort of sew the cells together. And ideally, you want high levels of those tight junction proteins because you don't want leakage of any of the stuff that's in your intestines to just freely move through. There should be controlled exit of the contents of the, the lumen um, uh, into the lymph system or, or into circulation. Um, and so we find that when you feed a high fat diet, and that usually is more than 40% of your calories from fat and usually also uh, high levels of saturated fat. For example, we had our diet was about, uh, in most cases, our metabolic inflexibility diet was like 50% of, of sat, of, excuse me, 50% of fat was from saturated fat. Um, that you see decreased levels of those tight junction proteins and you get actually chronically elevated levels of lipopolysaccharide or LPS. And we term that um, metabolic endotoxemia. Now it's not that you will have, it's not that you'll ever have zero, like levels at zero um, of LPS. And what, what's actually classified as metabolic endotoxemia kind of varies um, in the literature. You can have uh, other things can increase um, circulating LPS, even just really intense exercise. So we've actually seen elevated uh, LPS levels in um, marathon runners, like right after the marathon. Mm -hmm. um, so you can clear these things. And so that's the other big takeaway is that you don't have to detox or do a colon cleanse or something like that. The LPS actually um, is what we would say detoxified in the liver. So the toxic portion of the LPS, quote unquote, or the portion of the LPS that actually binds to the immune receptor and causes an immune response, causes that inflammation, that's taken care of in the liver. And so you don't have to worry about doing a detox or anything like that. Like, you know, number one secret doctors don't want you to know, having a liver and kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just want to stress that because when people do these detoxes and colon cleanses, not only is it sort of dangerous to take um, herbal supplements, but um, they, it can cause diarrhea and you can actually um, cause damage to the not only the microbiome, but actually you know, just physical damage to the, um, the inside of the uh, intestine because you're removing this protective mucus layer and things like that. So, um, yes. You can have leakage of LPS from the gut into circulation. And yes, that can cause low-grade inflammation. And yes, we have linked that to metabolic inflexibility. And what usually comes along with that is the high-fat diet and obesity um, and type 2 diabetes. The other thing to realize is that um, not only do we see increased levels of the immune receptor to which it binds, so we call that toll-like receptor 4, this is part of the innate immune system. These receptors are expressed pretty much everywhere. So if you do have chronic levels of LPS, you may be affecting more than just your skeletal muscle metabolism. I've been doing some reading more in even um, the reproductive system that it can actually affect um, fertility in both males and females. Yeah. So, um, as I'm, as I'm, you know, going down the rabbit hole, I am realizing, um, just really what a widespread effect this LPS can have. Um, so I'm, I'm, people are probably wondering at this point, oh my gosh, you know, I have this LPS circulating around, like, what am I supposed to do? Um, and like I said, not that, not to knock, um, dietary fats, but, you know, I, I, I would say that in terms of practical application, yep. eating a diet that is less than 40% fat probably is prudent. Um, ensuring that you have uh, a mixture of both plant and animal-based proteins because those bacteroidetes, they um, metabolize animal proteins um, that, and then they can, there's limited research to show that they may be producing some harmful metabolites. 
Um, that's questionable. But just to make an extrapolation, if you have really high levels of bacteroides that are um, able to break down proteins, they're not going to be exclusive to just dietary proteins. And so um, when we feed mice uh, a low fiber, high fat, high animal protein diet, we do see that they actually have a, a reduction in mucus levels in the gut, a reduction in those protective mucus levels. Um, but again, I mean, dietary protein is, I'm, I'm not, you know, one of the, the proponents of, oh, only eat the RDA. There's plenty of research to show that a moderate slash high protein diet, depending on how you define that. Um, but, you know, when we're looking at upwards of 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight plus, that's definitely considered a high protein diet has tons of health benefits. So definitely not knocking dietary protein. Um, but if you could, you know, make it a combination of both animal and plant based proteins, that would just increase the plant intake that, that right. you know, of your diet. Um, so that's kind of the next big thing. So, you know, controlling fat intake, mixing both plant and animal proteins, and then eating a plant based, not necessarily plant exclusive, but plenty of um, plant based um, vegetables, uh, both fibrous and starchy plant based vegetables. Well, you know what I mean? Um, but plant based carbohydrates is what I meant. Um, so you're getting a, a high fiber diet. That's really what it should translate to. But like I mentioned before, not all fibers are treated in the same way. Um, so some fibers are readily fermentable and others are not. So the fibers like cellulose is not really fermentable by bacteria. Cellulose is the, it's a structural component. It's a structural carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. um, it helps to create bulk in the stool, which is really important. It also sort of scrapes against the uh, intestinal cells and increases their mucus production, which is also really helpful because now you have a protective, thicker protective mucus layer, and it also helps with lubricating transit. Um, so cellulose is super important. So you can get that in um, like celery and the skins of fruits and vegetables, um, but it's not really readily fermentable. So the benefit of that is that you get a lot of benefits of the fiber and you don't get some of the side effects like the gas and bloating right. that come with the fermentation. But we do want to have fermentable sources of fiber as well. Um, so things like what we've actually seen that's been super effective in research for helping to control appetite and weight are things like inulin and beta-glucan. Um, so basically constituents of like whole wheat bran, whole wheat, whole grains. Um, and I brought some um, props with me. So um, this is, so over here we have Kroger, um, but this is a store brand of psyllium husk. I don't know if you can read. Oh, yeah. We that. can get that on like okay. MyProtein. That's a big website. Okay. That. Yes. Um, so psyllium, this is an example of a fiber that is pretty fermentable. So um, it will help in terms of, you know, still it will help to add bulk to the stool and um, help with transit and things like that. This is sold as, you know, a gentle, it's a non-stimulant laxative. So this is going to be a little bit more beneficial for your gut bacteria. Um, whereas if we have, this is citrus cell, this is a sugar-free version. This is methyl cellulose. Um, I don't know if you can read that, but methyl cellulose. Now, because this is cellulose, it's not readily fermentable. So on the front, they give you some cool claims um, that they're true but it won't cause um, excess gas and bloating right. and things like that. Um, so just to keep that in mind that if you have something that's not fermentable, it's not going to be treated in the same way. It may not help with the short chain fatty acid production, but it helps in other ways. So um, if you can't, you know, handle a lot of the fibrous fruits and vegetables, maybe you do have some sensitivity to those types of carbohydrates um, but you still want the some of the benefits of fiber, you could go for more of a cellulose type of supplement. Um, but if you can handle it, <laughs> and you know, bloating is it's unpleasant, but that doesn't make it necessarily dangerous. It's not necessarily an indicator that there's anything wrong with your gut health, your bacteria are just fermenting fiber. And sometimes they make short chain fatty acids. Sometimes they make gases like methane, <laughs> and that's just, you know, it's the reality of it. Um, so it, it may be that you just kind of have to adjust to that, and it may take a couple weeks. Um, now, in terms of how... Uh -huh. 
I was just going to ask is just so I think the listeners will have heard of like insoluble and soluble fiber is the fermentable, the soluble and the non-fermentable, the insoluble. Or is that different? Yeah. So you, right. So soluble fibers usually have low fermentability or excuse me, soluble fibers usually have high fermentability cool. and then the insoluble fibers usually have low fermentability. So if you're going to, if you eat something that when you add, a liquid to it, it becomes sort of like a gelatinous mass. That's not a soluble fiber. If you if you have something that, you know, if you add water to it, it does nothing, that's going to be an insoluble fiber. So that's why, you know, if you put like an apple skin or celery or something in water, nothing happens. But if you add water to your oatmeal, yeah. um, your wheat bran, yeah, then it'll become a nice gelatinous mass. Viscous. <laughs> and it's just nice um, to have yeah. a combination of both. Exactly. Yep, absolutely. Um, now, a lot of people think that they may have, you know, a gluten sensitivity. Um, so they're avoiding gluten. A gluten-free diet is going to be much lower in fiber. Now, it may be that the removal of gluten is helpful, but in more cases, it's actually the removal of those fermentable fibers. So we call the low, low FODMAP diet. Um, that stands for low um fructo oligo di mono and polyols so it's just these it's just different names for for saccharides or type of carbohydrates so by removing those from the diet you remove the fermentable fibers and then the bacteria aren't fermenting them and creating a bunch of gas and bloating um so that certainly can be helpful uh but the other um things that people might want to remove if they're experiencing a lot of gastric upset and gas and things like that. Lactose is really one of the biggest contributors. A lot of people develop lactose intolerance later in life. Not the same thing as a dairy allergy. It's just that you don't have the enzyme to break down that specific saccharide, um, lactose, milk. Um, so that's one thing. And then also removing sugar alcohols. So um, I actually just contributed to a piece um, for uh, Shape Magazine on eating a protein bar every day. And, you know, that's totally fine to do, but a lot of protein bars contain sugar mm. alcohols, um, mannitol, xylitol, erythritol. And um, some of those, and it really depends on your, your gut too. Some people can handle them just fine. Um, mannitol seems to be sort of the worst in terms of, you know, even at lower doses, it causes issues. Uh, erythritol seems to be um, handled the best by most people. But in general, you probably want to keep those sugar alcohol levels to 20 grams or less per day. And I've seen some bars that have more than 20 grams mm -hmm. of sugar alcohols or, you know, one bar will have 12 and, and now you're at over half of what you need for the day. Um, so kind of keeping, keeping that in mind that, um, you know, bloating isn't an indication that something is necessarily wrong, but it's uncomfortable. And so while we do want to get fiber in the diet, um, if it's something that's causing you extreme gastric upset, then you may need to actually be limiting some of the fiber in your diet, not necessarily gluten. Um, and, and really there, there have been some longitudinal studies in, in children and adults that eating a low, uh, gluten-free diet can actually correlate with increased weight gain, um, both in people who have celiac and not. And it could be that, you know, if you are eating a much lower fiber diet, maybe you don't have as much appetite regulation or some people do it because they think that, um, it will just miraculously cause weight loss. That's absolutely not the case. Mm -hmm. You need a gluten deficit. Um, so the next section is on pre and probiotics. Um, kind of already talked about the prebiotics basically are just fibers that can be fermented by those bacteria that we can use to make short chain fatty acids. Um, and then probiotics are actual bacteria that you would ingest. We also have symbiotics, which is a, a combination of pre and probiotics. Um, so probiotics and, and kind of dietary supplements in general, you really have to be careful with what you're purchasing. Um, in the U.S., the way that they're regulated, it's, it's a different umbrella from food and drugs. Not to say that the whole market is deregulated, but supplements are not... Um, it, required to be tested for efficacy, purity, or safety. 
um, until they, they hit the market. And then it's sort of like retroactively. And um, I actually have a friend who works in that section um, of the FDA. There's like 40 people that do like food testing and stuff. And he was like, yeah, we kind of just test supplements like if we get to them. <laughs> so, um, but what, yeah, I know, I know. Um, but one thing you can look for is you can, there are a few different labels. There's an NSF label that's specifically for sports. So it's a third party company, uh, that tests purity of supplements. And, and so manufacturers can elect to have the purity testing done. So an NSF label is one, or you can also look for United States Pharmacopoeia, a USP label. So, you know, that if your supplement has one of those labels that what you see on the ingredients list is accurate. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking for a probiotic, because if you think about it, I mean, this is like using an eyedropper in the ocean. You have tens of trillions of bacteria in your gut. So if you're taking like 1 million acidophilus, it's not probably going to do anything. So you want to look for something that's in the billions of colony forming units or CFUs and ideally a multi-strain probiotic as well. So that means you're going to see multiple types of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. Um, and while they haven't really shown to be effective for like weight loss necessarily, um, they definitely have been shown to improve the symptoms of inflammatory bowel diseases. So removing, uh, reducing the instance, uh, the um, uh, prevalence of, of bouts of bacteria or constipation. Um, they've also been linked to, um, in some cases, improved blood lipid panels, um, even like lowering blood pressure, influencing anxiety and depressive symptoms. Um, so like I had mentioned, I mean, the, the gut the microbiome um, is, it goes far beyond just gut health. I mean, it really does get to overall metabolic and mental health. Um, so if you are, you know, looking for a probiotic, I would recommend first, it's sort of like, you know, we want to get, um, when you're planning a diet, you don't start with a supplement. So you start with energy balance, mm -hmm. look at your overall diet first. You know, if you're eating kind of the standard American westernized diet where you're eating a lot of refined carbohydrates and saturated fats, and you're not getting a lot of fiber and you're really never eating fruits or vegetables that's the first thing that you really want to do. And then you can look at adding a probiotic. And ideally that probiotic comes with, um, you know, like I said, at least a billion colony forming units and multiple strains of bacteria. And then once you have, you know, your diet in place and you're making sure you're getting sufficient fiber, which should be 25 plus grams per day to so about 25 up to about 40 grams per day is what you want to aim for. Then you can add um, a probiotic. You can also add some other foods that can be both pre and probiotic, like fermented foods, because um, fermented foods will contain bacteria. And in some cases, they also contain fiber, like kimchi. So that's a fermented, well, there's a lot of different types of kimchi, but it's basically fermented vegetables, um, apple cider vinegar, um, uh, Greek yogurt, things like that that have been fermented. They're going to have some beneficial bacteria as well. And so integrating those into your diet every day. And, um, you know, I know like apple cider vinegar, everyone tries to say that it like cures every single thing. I'm not that person, <laughs> but um, I do make a practice of at night before bed, I have my sort of little um, pre-probiotic shake, if you want to call it that. And it's basically just apple cider vinegar and then a fiber supplement. And I do eat a plant-based diet. I mean, I eat plants at every single meal, but, you know, just to give myself like a little bit extra oomph. And I actually don't take a probiotic because everything else is how it should be in my diet, exercises regularly. And um, I don't have any sort of issues. So I just don't feel like that's an investment that I want to make because they, to get a good one, they are probably going to be um, over here. They run about 50 or so dollars for about a month's supply for a probiotic. Wow. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not a necessity if you have everything else uh, aligned, then you're probably good. You probably don't need a probiotic. But if you do have issues, you know, with gas and bloating and um, you've been diagnosed with IBS, then it may be something that you want to look into. But like I said, you have to make sure that everything else in your diet 
you know, get that straight first and then look into a supplement. Okay. Um, no, that's, I just want to yeah. highlight that because I think listeners will be like, Oh, I should be getting all these supplements. I should be going out and buying kimchi and all of these things. And, um, I think the point you made where if you're getting kind of sufficient fiber, you're having lots of fruit and vegetables within your diet, then you're probably, if you aren't experiencing any downsides at the moment, your digestion is okay. You haven't got serious bloating or maybe diarrhea. I don't know if that's something that could be a problem. Then you you probably don't need to make that next step of investment unless there's something telling you you should. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you absolutely can, you know, you can try it, but um, I just, I, I don't want to be, you know, pushing supplements and whatnot when, in, in fact, most people just don't have, you know, a nutrient-dense plant-based diet. Um, now, the one caveat to that I would say is, is if, the, if you have gone on antibiotics for some reason, then absolutely it's beneficial to take a probiotic, um, especially if you're looking at like a broad-spectrum antibiotic. That can actually have lasting effects on the microbiome, and it can affect many, not just the pathogenic bacteria. Um, and, uh, and I guess one other thing that, that people are really curious about is, you know, how long do the effects last? How quickly does my microbiome change? How much can I change it? You can cause kind of species level changes really within 24 hours of a drastic diet change. Um, and the effects of, of a, of a long, um, and, you know, perhaps high dose of antibiotics, uh, that can last years wow. in, yeah, in some studies on, um, artificial sweeteners, I forgot to talk about that. Um, that's another area, um, which I will say you can, the, the FDA has set upper limits of, of safe amounts of, um, artificial sweeteners like sucralose and saccharin and aspartame. It is extremely difficult to actually reach those limits. And even if you do, um, there haven't been a, a ton of studies, but there have been some studies in humans. Um, in sucralose, it's very difficult to reach those levels. And there were some changes in the microbiome that researchers had linked to insulin resistance. But those individuals, I believe, were ingesting somewhere in the range of um, a can of soda for every pound, four pounds of body weight. So it's really difficult to actually drink that much. Mm. Or if you're looking at um, saccharin, they actually fed individuals the acceptable intake limit of saccharin. Um, and some people did, some of the individuals had, it, it did experience changes in the microbiome. Others didn't. So it's very individual. Um, and they found that in some people who, who experienced changes, those lasted for months, even after the study was, was done. So it's very, you know, it's very dependent upon your personal microbiome. But the reality is that you probably won't even be able to ingest that much to cause an effect. So um, aspartame was the one that they found had effects at the lowest levels of intake, um, about three, the equivalent of about three cans of soda a day. Um, so that may be one that, you know, if you have concerns, you could limit. But again, you know, if, you're, if we're including this in our diet in moderation, then it's going to be fine. Um, but those are just some examples of how much we can change the gut and how long those changes actually last. Like I mentioned, when we look at diet and exercise, um, each of those can, in studies so far, seem to explain about 20% of microbial diversity. So together, 40%. Um, and, you know, yeah, you can see changes after 24 hours. Uh, they can last for years. But you won't really see a complete overhaul of the gut. So if your gut is really high in formicutes, even though you may see changes at the species level, like different types of lactobacillus, um, you probably will just always have a higher formicutes type gut. Um, if you lack diversity, you can probably increase the diversity a little bit. But you may not be able to like completely diversify your gut to you know have it comparable to someone who has always had a diverse gut. 
Um, but these are just, I mean, these are kind of hypotheses, they're theories, because you, we don't have any studies so far where we're like taking a baby and looking at its gut microbiome and, you know, tracking it throughout its entire life. We can really just kind of take snapshots and look at correlations. Um, so just realizing that, yeah, you can't do a complete overhaul. It's sort of like, you're not, if you want to do a remodel to your home, you might like add, you know, an extension to the garage or something, but you're not going to like bulldoze it all down and build a new one. So that's, that's kind of how the gut works as well. I guess in um, many ways it's similar to like your potential muscle growth or like strength gains. We have yes. so much we can do with our nutrition and training, but there's genetics, which is kind of like where the gut's kind of standing, where that contributes quite a big deal of to things, which is in some ways kind of scary for some people. But um, I guess if someone has a, they, I don't know, they were just born into an environment where they don't have a great gut and you see these people, I have clients who are like this, they have to take care of everything else. And they still, mm-hmm. there could be someone who has an awful diet, but they have that 60% like full and they had a, they just had that great childbirth, whatever, however it set them up. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because it's really, it's just your gut sort of predisposes you. I would say it could predispose you to be more obesogenic or it could predispose you to, to maintain leanness. Um, and it, and really, so, so the ability of your um, microbiome to sort of extract energy from the diet, that's one of the ways that we can kind of classify an enterotype. Um, that can that can be a double edged sword. You know, if you are a person living in um, a developing country and you're subsisting primarily on a diet of you know tubers and grains, and your diet is very low in calories, you absolutely want to have that obesogenic microbiome. You want to have a microbiome that can ferment those fibers to short chain fatty acids because it took something that you could not extract energy from and made it into something that you can extract energy from. So we can actually see that this may, these short chain fatty acids may supply, I've seen ranges of anywhere from 6% all the way up to 15% um, of your energy needs. So when people say, oh, you know, I don't count the fiber or I only count net carbs, I actually tell my clients, you should really count all of those carbohydrates because you can't assume that you're not getting any calories. Mm -hmm. You absolutely can. But if we're in, uh, you know, the United States or, you know, in a developed country and we have plenty of food available and we have that same obesogenic um, microbiome, that's, that can be problematic because now we can extract energy from the diet that we don't necessarily need or want. Um, so, yeah, so you have this sort of predisposition and... It can also even influence feeding behaviors. Um, I, I delved a little bit into, um, not in this book, but I will in the upcoming gut health book, on um, the role of the microbiome in disordered eating habits. So if you have increased, they, there's a, they, they interact in some way with the endocannabinoid system. So yeah, the same stuff that you know, we're like smoking and things like that. Um, but yeah, so cannabinoids we know can increase um, appetite. Similarly, the gut microbiome may be able to increase appetite and increase hedonic eating. So that's eating when we're not hungry, but just for pleasure. A high fat diet increases hedonic eating actually, um, especially in mice. Yeah. So that could be one role. Um, So, so yeah, you, you could have this predisposition to enjoying food more, eating more food and extracting more energy from the diet. And so you're more predisposed to to obesity versus someone who has a different microbiome. They don't think about food that much, and you know they don't have um, a propensity towards eat, overeating and things like that. Um, and then I think the the final um, aspect would be you know physical activity and exercise. Um, voluntary exercise. So you can you can make a mouse run on a treadmill <laughs> um, by sort of electrocuting him if he stops, um, or you can just put a wheel in the mouse's cage and, and let it run on its own. Just like humans, there are some mice who want to exercise and some who don't. Like some, you'll put the wheel in there, they will not have any part of it. They don't want to run on it. But voluntary exercise is uh, correlated with increased microbial diversity, um, increased numbers of Prevotella, which is sort of like kind of a new and fancy emerging bacteria that 
people are probably, you know, we might be jumping into conclusions saying like, oh, if you have more Prevotella, you're going to be more fit. Um, that's not necessarily the case because Prevotella are also linked to carbohydrate metabolism. And in most cases, people who are athletic are eating a high carbohydrate diet. Um, so we have to be kind of careful about what conclusions we're coming to. Um, but certainly we see increased microbial diversity in people who are um, uh, habitual exercisers. And uh, there have been a couple studies that have come out and, and linked um, microbial diversity to uh, cardiorespiratory fitness. So we can kind of um, say that, you know, if you have, if you're, if, if you have a greater VO2 max, then you're going to have a more diverse gut. Um, but again, we can't say, you know, chicken versus egg, like does a, does increased gut m microbial diversity, you know, enhance your cardiorespiratory fitness or vice versa. We don't really know because there are so many different aspects that go into microbial diversity and exercise performance and things like that. Um, but it's important to um, keep in mind that uh, exercise sort of has a dose dependent effect on the gut uh, in general. If you are overtraining, that actually can lead to more gut permeability and um, sort of unregulated inflammation. So we do want to have this post exercise inflammatory response that's normal, but then we need to have the anti inflammatory response to keep that regulated. And so if you were, um, you know, following just a balls to the wall, completely crazy, um, you know, ultra endurance type of schedule, you really need to make sure that you're rest enough um, because that will influence your gut health. And then that can influence, you know, overall immune function. Uh, a lot of people aren't thinking of it in terms of like what's going on in your gut. You know, they're just yeah. like, oh, okay, if you overtrain, it increases your, your risk of, um, uh, illness. Um, so that's one, another area of nation has been shown to be helpful is in, in, um, endurance and ultra endurance athletes. Really they're one of their number one complaints is GI distress. And so taking a, a probiotic actually has been shown to be helpful in sort of alleviating, um, like, you know, diarrhea is probably one of the, the top like runner's trots. Um, right. so alleviating some of those symptoms. Cool. No, I mean, amazing. And, I mean, I can't wait for the book. And I think I, I think for the listeners, because you covered so much, I'd love to kind of summarize the main points of in terms of what can they practically apply from what you've said and also mm -hmm. then identifying if there is something con for concern, like when you're thinking about someone who has a like healthy gut, if that's the term, and then someone who has maybe a problem and maybe they both of them have like for like diets, what is like what are the problems that someone might experience if they have a concern? Um, so obviously in terms of, uh, I can try and summarize, but I think it was kind of the, the 25 to 40 grams of fiber, having mm -hmm. lots of vegetables within your diet um, and a yes. combination of soluble, insoluble fibers, potentially supplementation can play a role and help you as well. Having kind of some of those fermentable foods, um, actually mm -hmm. on the for fermental, fermentable foods, is there a difference between sauerkraut and why well, I particularly sauerkraut, which I love this pasteurized, which isn't in a fridge. Is that any good for you? Um, because I think it's meant to have not been fermented or some process has changed obviously, or you've taken out the bacteria, which is helpful. Right. Yeah. So if you pasteurize something, you're actually heat killing everything. So you would want to go for, but <laughs> So this is sort of um, because there can be dangers to eating things that are like raw, unpasteurized, like raw milk is is really popular right now. Um, so I would say, you know, look at the the labels will usually tell you that it contains, you know, live bacteria. Um, if you want to try and make your own, that's one option. Just be very careful and make sure that you're doing it in the safest way possible. Um, I just want to stress that any time that you're eating a food that contains bacteria, there is a chance that it could also contain pathogenic bacteria. So, um, you know, just be careful in terms of what you're buying. So if you're having something that's pasteurized, yeah, it won't have those beneficial bacteria. But if you're having something that's unpasteurized, you know, just be aware of possible health risks. Um, very yeah. interesting. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll stick to my Greek yogurt, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an easy um, one. Yes, exactly. Yep. And then apart from the, the vegetables, I mean, 
the eating vegetables, fruits, whole grains, like an overall healthy diet with plenty of fiber and all of those great things. Being relatively active is also a good thing, which I think that that combination, I think most of the listeners will be there keeping sweeteners yeah. and those sort of sugar alcohols either in mo- like moderation and also just being aware mm-hmm. of that could have an impact, see how you respond to it and adjust appropriately. So then if you're doing all of that yes. and maybe you're still experiencing potentially, I mean, things I personally, to, to be embarrassed, I mean, I've personally had times when I've had like diarrhea or I've had slight constipation mm-hmm. before, or I've had like severe bloating. And I don't, sometimes I've related it to potentially things, but I'm never completely sure. Is Are those signs that something's not quite right? And then what is a good, like, how should a normal healthy gut be functioning? Mm-hmm. Um. I mean, in terms of, you know, bowel movement regularity and things like that, that's also highly individual. And I would say the first thing, like if you were experiencing chronic constipation or chronic diarrhea or painful bloating, you know, definitely go to, um, uh, like I, I have my PhD, not MD, you know, so definitely the first step would be to visit your GP, Mm -hmm. um, And, you know, let them know your symptoms or go to a gastroenterologist and, you know, they probably will have, they may recommend like an elimination diet. Like I had mentioned the low FODMAP diet. Um, So eliminating things one at a time. Um, So Whole30 is an example. It's actually, you know, they they kind of promote it as like a detox cleansing kind kind of diet. It's really just an elimination diet. It's to help you determine if there are foods that you don't digest very well. So, you know, try to eliminate lactose first for a week. Do nothing else to your diet. Just eliminate lactose, dairy products, and see if you feel better. If you do, you probably figured it out. Okay, so you can't have lactose. If you don't feel any better, then lactose wasn't the problem, and it may be one of these other FODMAP type of foods. Um, So it may be that you just have to kind of limit the the, the diversity of your diet for a little while. And I personally, I mean, because I've had issues along the same vein, like I, you know, yeah, bloating is normal, but it's not pleasant. And so if you want to avoid that, you know, you kind of have to figure out what foods you can digest or not. Um, so some good low FODMAP vegetables that I use are like zucchini and squash. Those are my primary vegetables because I know that if I try to eat too much broccoli or cauliflower, I'm just going to be really uncomfortable. And a lot of people experience that. And I know that I'm lactose intolerant. So I go for, you know, the, the lactose free milk. It's been ultra filtered. And so I don't have to worry about getting the lactose in my diet. Um, so yeah, step one, you know, go to the doctor. Step two, kind of do an elimination diet and see if there are foods that you can pinpoint that are causing issues. Um, and then like you had mentioned, you know, making sure that you're getting sufficient fiber If you do experience chronic constipation, um, it's really important that you don't chronically use laxatives, especially stimulant laxatives. You can actually form a dependence on stimulant laxatives. So those are things like um, X-lax and whatnot, like they have um, bisacodyl in them. Uh, So those should be used, you know, just every once in a while. Like if it's just something that, oh, you were really constipated just, you know, for a day and you use that, that's okay. But it can be dangerous to use those chronically. Um, And they also will have an influence on the microbiome because that will actually cause increased transit, um, uh, rapid transit through the gut. So your microbiome, your your gut bacteria basically won't have time to metabolize those nutrients and that can cause your bacteria levels to fall. So just be very careful with, you know, the supplements that you're using. Um, I think that... Those would be my big recommendations. Um, You definitely, you know, oh, and the other thing, antibiotics. So if you are prescribed an antibiotic, use it as directed. Um, You know, it's a contentious area when we talk about antibiotic use, especially over here with industrialized farming and the amount of antibiotics, you know, that that animals need to be fed in order to to make sure that they grow properly. Um, But really one of the biggest issues that people don't talk about so much is not the use, but the abuse of antibiotics. So people aren't taking the full strain of antibiotics or they're taking them for things that are not bacterial infections. And that's how we end up with resistant strains of bacteria, or you end up with, you know, really having negative effects on your microbiome. Um, So if your doctor has prescribed you an antibiotic, it's for a reason, take it as directed, take it with a probiotic, 
and don't use it for anything that it's not supposed to be used for. Amazing. Um, no, I think those are some great takeaways for people to have a think about um, and apply for themselves. And I think this is going to hopefully clear up a lot of maybe misconceptions, like a lot of things. It's not necessarily that something that's been thrown out there, like the apple cider vinegar is completely like black and white, terrible or great. It's kind of like, well, it has a purpose, but this is the purpose. So I absolutely love that. I think listeners are going to have really enjoyed it. If they want to reach out to you, I know you're obviously an RP coach, so you'll be on the website mm-hmm. there, uh, but you've also got your own blog, Instagram and Facebook, I've noticed. Yes. Yeah. So I'm on Instagram and Facebook as vitamin PhD and, and then is vitamin PhD nutrition.com. Um, and then they, they can contact me there uh, or they can email me. It's just Gabrielle at renaissance Um But yeah, definitely reach out to me on Facebook. Um, check me out on Instagram. I've been contributing to a few different articles for Oxygen Shape and Reader's Digest on things like supplements and meal prep and protein bars. Um, and I'm always looking for, you know, more ideas um, to write about. This um, next, gut, uh, excuse me, the next ebook is going to be out probably end of summer or into fall, um, so they can look at that. And I have a list um, of take homes at the end of that chapter as well to just tell you, like, you know, these are the things you should include in your diet. You know, this is what you should do for exercise and so on. Um, and can uh, you know, I think we're going to have even like a list of like kind of our FODMAP foods and things like that. So if you're having some gastric upset eat these foods, maybe don't eat so much of these foods. Um, And then yeah, in the next year, I'm going to be writing this expansive gut health book. Every time I thought of a a new question, I came up with another chapter. So um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really, really excited for that. It's even going to get into things like, you know, like I said, reproductive health and whatnot, and some of these areas that are just really not research. And I mean, there are even links to the microbiome and breast cancer. So, um, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a really amazing area. So I'm super excited to just keep learning about it. Awesome. I'll make sure those are all linked below. And I think, um, if you would come on again, we can delve into some of those areas. And if the community do have any, or the listeners rather do have any questions, um, comment them below and that might turn into another podcast. I think that'd be really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Gabrielle. And thank you everyone for listening. We'll catch you soon.